This is one of those things you didn't know you needed, but you'll end up using it every single day. This is Pydantic, but maybe not the Pydantic you're used to because it got a pretty big update. Pydantic will keep your Python project from turning into a data nightmare. I like to think of Pydantic as a playbook if you're the coach and the players are the Python objects. It makes sure that each player is doing exactly what it needs to do. And in this video, we are gonna cover three things about Pydantic. First, we're gonna cover what Pydantic is and why you should have it in your project. Second, we'll go over how Pydantic saved a startup. And then finally, we'll wrap up this video with coding examples so you can implement Pydantic within your project. If you're new to the channel, I'm Eric Roby, a software engineer with over a decade of experience, and I have helped thousands of developers learn and grow within their craft. Let's start with what Pydantic is. Pydantic is a data validation and settings management library for Python. At its core, it's all about making sure your data is clean, correct, and exactly what you expect without having to write tons of boilerplate code. Pydantic achieves this by allowing you to define Python classes as these Pydantic data models. Therefore, if you create a Python object with incorrect data, Pydantic will handle the errors and exceptions without crashing your system. And crashing a system is very popular in many applications that deal with RESTful API endpoints where a user sends in bad data. And if you don't write code to properly handle the bad data, then your app is toast. Now, what makes Pydantic so popular is that it all happens behind the scenes. And literally, you don't have to do anything. You may hear this also referred to as under the hood or automagically or just magically. And that's the way it should be. Any of which means you don't have to deal with any of the code. And Pydantic comes automatically, so another automatically, with popular frameworks like FastAPI and SQL Model. And that's exactly what Alex did when his startup was about to crash. Alex was an engineer who was working at a very fast growing startup. Alex was tasked with integrating their APIs into clients apps who did no validation. You probably know where this is going. The clients dates were strings, names were in all capital letters, emails didn't list the service provider, and probably the worst out of all of them, their object unique identifier, which everyone in the entire world and every application in the world calls an ID, they called it UI for unique identifier. Well, Alex first tried to fix all this data with manual checks using guard clauses and exception handling, which at first did the trick. There were so many issues with API points that needed integrated. So instead of handling all of these exceptions himself, he made Pydantic models do all the work for him. Alex's quick turnaround made the CEO impressed because their application was validated super fast. If you want to be an Alex and learn how to implement Pydantic, then let's dive into the code so you can also learn how to use Pydantic in your application. So right here, we have an example of a Python object that just prints the user. So we have a user that has a name, an age, a height, all wrapped in a constructor. We have this magic method that'll just print the attributes when we want to print the user. And we can see that if we run the application, we get user attributes, John Doe, 30 and 52. Now, Pydantic really stands out because it's kind of like a data class where it comes with a lot of magic automatically built in. So the very first thing we're going to do is just import Pydantic and its secret sauce, which is base model. And to be able to use Pydantic, we of course need to install it. I forgot to install it. So let's go ahead and say pip install Pydantic. Now, after you install Pydantic, we will see that this yellow line will go away and we are able to use this base model. Now, what we can do here is we can just define the attributes of user instead of creating this constructor. So I'm just gonna delete all of this and say name of type string, age of type int, and height of type int. All right, so now if we go ahead and save and we rerun the application by just saying Python 3 main.py, we can see immediately that it says user, here's the user, takes a no arguments. And that's because right now we just have a normal Python class. To be able to use Pydantic and all the specialness that comes with it, we have to use this base model. So I'm just going to grab base model and we can pass it in so user implements base model. 
Now if we go ahead and rerun the application, we can see that it says name equals John Doe, age equals 30, and height equals 52. Now you might be thinking, well, that's different than what we have here in this magic method. And that's because Pydantic overrides this and just prints the attributes in its own way. So now we can go ahead and delete that, and we can see that if we rerun the application, we get the exact same thing. So automatically already, Pydantic allows us to be able to take in this base model that automatically creates the constructor and a way for us to be able to print the user. Instead of just getting like object equals XX5 and it talks about the memory location, it'll print the entire user. Real quick, if you've enjoyed the video, please subscribe to be notified of upcoming videos and check out my best selling fast API course linked below. Now let's go ahead and import field. This allows us to now do data validation on each of these properties. So we can start by saying this name of type string equals a field with minimal length of three. We can say the same thing for our age, but say it must be greater than 18. And then height, we can say greater than 48 or less than 70. And where we're going with this is like a roller coaster or something like that, where we have to have a name where no name can be under three letters. You must be greater than age 18 and you must be between four feet and like, I don't even know what that is, like almost seven feet. No, 70 divided by 12, 12, 24, 36, 48, 60. Oh, I was way off, five foot 10. <laughs> All right, so you must be between four feet and five foot 10. So now if we go ahead and run the application, we can see that this will work. John Doe is longer than three characters and age is greater than 18. But if you change any of these to be a different information than these fields, and we go ahead and try and run it, we can see that the application throws an exception and it's happening from Pydantic validation error where one validation error for the user. So what we can see here is we are allowing users to be able to create a user, but we have validation. So if we like change this to only two letters, this will throw an error based on string should have at least three characters. And then if we do the same thing for height and we say it's going to be 45, which is less than 48, and we run it, we're going to see that the input needs to be greater than 48 for height. So we're properly implementing validation already, and that's how quick it is in Pydantic to be able to implement validation. We can just add in our base model, which does a lot of magic for our objects, and then we can go ahead and add field, which allows us to have minimal length, greater than, greater than, less than, all that fancy stuff, which is really, really helpful. Now let's go ahead and add two more fields. Let's go ahead and add email and username. So email is gonna be of type string and our username is gonna be of type string as well. However, for our username, let's go ahead and say equals field minimal length of five. All right, so this all looks really, really good. Now, the only thing that we probably want to do is add some kind of validation on the email. And typically when you're doing validation on the email, you're gonna wanna have a service provider, which could be like Gmail or Yahoo or whatever that is. You're gonna want a .com, so serviceprovider.com, and then you're gonna want an at sign. So it could be like testuser at gmail.com. And we could create a custom validator for that, but really there's a much, much easier way to do that. And we can just install something called email validator, which comes with Pydantic, but it comes as a separate um, smaller library that you need to install with it. So let's go ahead and say pip install email validator. Now, once you install that, we can come up here and import something called email string. And now we can say the email is of type email string. And that's all you have to do for email. And now we have our email validated with Pydantic and it's gonna check for all of those use cases that you need when dealing with Pydantic or dealing with emails. So now over here, we can say comma, where we need to now say an email for test purposes. I'm just gonna say test. And then username can be ybor222. Awesome, awesome. That's just Roby backwards with three twos at the end. All right, so now let's go ahead and rerun our application and we can see immediately we get an error because the email must have an at sign followed by a service provider. So we can just go ahead and say test at 
gmail.com. If we do this, everything looks great. However, our username is just needs a minimal length of five. Well, what if there's like other use cases? What if we have like a list of usernames? And we want to make sure that there's no duplicates inside this list. Well, for us to be able to properly do that, we need to go ahead and create our custom validator because there's no easy way of using field to make sure that like we are using only alphabetical letters, only numbers, and we need to make sure that it's not in this user's list. There's going to be a bunch of different tests that we need to do to be able to do that. But in Pydantic, we can add this automatically and make it a field validator. So inside this object, so it's not going to be a new function inside this object, we need to use something called a field validator. But before we can do that, we need to import it. So we can say up here, field validator. And now right here, let's go ahead and say at field validator, where we're going to say this validator is for our username attribute. And inside here now, we want to say def validate user, where we pass in our class. So we can just say CLS and a value. And our value is going to be our username. Here, we're going to do some pattern matching. So we can just say we want to import RE and then if not RE dot match, and we have to pass in the sequence that says a username must be alphabetical. Must be alphanumeric. And then we can pass in the value. And if that is a value, then we want to raise a value error. And where the value error is going to be username must contain only alpha numeric characters and underscores. Then we want to check and make sure the username hasn't already been used. So we can say if value in usernames raise value error. Username must be unique. And if everything passes, well, then we can say usernames dot append value. And then we want to return the value to set it to the attribute. So now if we go ahead and we try and run our application, we're going to get an error on our username because of our custom username. We have uh, this Wibor222 as a usernames list, and then we pass it in right here. So it matched on this condition right here where usernames must be unique. So what we can do here now is just add like a new thing to our usernames. And now if we go ahead and run our application, we can see that it fails again. And that's because I added an exclamation mark, but it only allows alphanumeric and underscores. So what we can do here is we can just add some new numbers at the end of that username. And if we run it now, everything works because we successfully just added our new object with the usernames that passed. Now, if we did it again, it's going all right, and that's it. That's how easy you can add Pydantic and data validation to your project, and I will see you in the next.